right, y'all. 2 Corinthians. Grab your Bibles. Go to 2 Corinthians. I'm going to put a disclaimer on today's teaching. Okay? Especially if this is your first time here. Churches get accused a lot of all they do is talk about money. All they do is talk about money. Let me clarify something here. Um, no, we don't. However, we teach expositorily. If you don't know what that means, that means we take a book of the Bible and we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. I love and I hate this. Okay? Uh, I love it because um, I love getting the broader context of a book, which I think you can even look back on what we've learned in 2 Corinthians and you can see that. Um, I love it because I'm never thinking, okay, what am I preaching on next week? Because I already know what I'm preaching on. Uh, anybody want to take a guess what I'm preaching on next Sunday? Yeah, chapter 10, okay? Uh, and so I, I love that. Do you know why I hate it? Because it forces me to preach about things I'd rather just not preach about. I have to preach about what is in the text that week. And so last week was pretty easy. Chapter 8 is about generosity. All right, that's, that's, that's easy to talk about. We want to be generous. Yes, we love being generous. That's, that's awesome. That's a good feeling thing. We're going to narrow it down this week to actually talk about giving primarily giving to the church. That's a little bit tougher. Okay, so, so that's my disclaimer uh, on this teaching today. Um, it might look, Kelly and I were having this talk on the way here this morning, it might look familiar to what we talked about last week. Okay, so just so we're all on the same page, this series, it's getting personal. Uh, we have named it this because this is the most personal of uh, Paul's letters to a church, you really just feel his heart uh, that he has for the church, for the believers there, the relationship they have, uh, you feel that as he's writing, okay? Um, and now in this portion, uh, he is talking about generosity and giving, and I, I thought about this, I'm glad Oaks is downstairs, um, I, I'm, I'm going to put it this way. I think people would rather talk about sex than money. Like, I just think they'd rather, I think money's more awkward to talk about for people than sex. Like, they'd be like, hey, let's have a 10-week series on sex. Okay, let's have a 10-week series on giving. That's too personal. Like, I just think, I just feel like, y'all need to wake up, okay? Um, it's okay. The preacher said sex. It's Okay. All right? It's a word. It's a thing. Don't worry about it. But I think money gets personal quick. Like, like we don't mind the church knowing a lot about us, but when it comes to our money, that's, that's private. Okay? Now, I talked about it last week, and listen, y'all know we don't do this. There are some churches I know that when you become a member, they ask for your W-2 because they're going to make sure you're giving 10%. Okay, we're going to dive a little bit into that this morning, but we're not going to be that way, all right? But giving is commanded. Giving is an act of faith that shows we are growing in our relationship with the Lord, okay? And that's why this series uh, goal that we've had for this series has been for Grassroots Church uh, to live out transformed lives as followers of Jesus. That's what we want to see. What does that look like? Each week we see what it looks like to live out a life that has been transformed by Jesus and we want to see what are what we would say markers of maturity. People want to claim, yes, I am a Christian. Awesome. There are things that show that the Holy Spirit is active in your life. And that's what we're looking at in this series. And that's what we see today. Last week we see generosity should be growing in us. And today we see that giving to the church should be one of those things. Now, uh, just so we understand, I want to give us a background on the idea of tithe. All right, This is a very quick 
uh, low-key background, so you're going to be like, oh, you missed this, this. Yes, I did. Uh, but this is just a quick background. Tithe. It's just a word that means a tenth. It's an Old Testament principle that the uh, nation of Israel would give a tenth, a tithe, 10% of their, and we say of their income, okay? Now the income, I want you to think about, uh, many of them had jobs where they didn't get paid in money. They got paid in other ways. Uh, they, the crops that they would bring in, the things that they would make, the things that they would barter and trade, they would take 10% of that and give it to the work of the temple, to the priests. And it would fund and fuel the work of the temple and the lives of the priests that worked there and did the work. Okay? Now, you can go further into it and find, you know, that there's more that they gave to the leadership, and that was actually to fund the governmental part of the Jewish nation. You would go further and understand that tithes and offerings could actually be separated in two different things. There's a lot more to it, but I want us to understand that in the New Testament, the idea of tithing carried over into the church and out of the Old Covenant, in the New Covenant, but now it's no longer a tithe. That 10% is what is uh, necessary or commanded. It's just a good place to start to give in faith. We give faithfully, we give joyfully, we give sacrificially. 10% is a great place to start. Uh, I remember having a conversation with one person one time and said, I don't know, my budget's so tight, I don't know if I... I said, listen, start with $5 a week. And anybody want to guess what happens when you do that? You don't miss it. You realize... Oh, I've been doing that for a while, and the Lord has sustained and blessed, and so you increase. And that's what we're talking about, this maturity. So, last week, if you weren't here, we had three points. We talked about in generosity, there's the act of generosity, the heart of generosity, and the result of generosity. When you look into chapter 9, guess what we find? All right, we're going to have three points. Because we're Baptists like that. Y'all kind of blew up the Baptist mentality, sitting in the front row, being all holy and stuff. Um, but, sorry, <laughs> y'all are like, we thought we did a good thing. I appreciate y'all. Um, three things that we're going to see today, okay? Three points. Is that giving is done in action. Giving begins in the heart. And giving results in God's glory. So once again, we see the act, we see the heart, and we see the result. But today, instead of generosity, because it, y'all, ever, y'all ever done that, um, the whole idea of, uh, well, you know they say, well, who's they? Them. Well, who's them? Those people. Who's those people? Out there. Well, who's out there? Everyone. Okay, it, it's a generalization. When we say generosity, that's a huge picture. And it's easy for us to go, yeah, we should be generous. But in this chapter, we're going to narrow it further down into actually our generosity, I think, can and should begin in giving to the church. So so we're going to get a little bit tighter here. And it can be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, And and so I just want to be gracious in this this morning. So let's start with giving is done in action. We're going to be in... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to read these. If you don't have a Bible in front of you, the verse will be on the screen. Uh, we're reading out of the ESV, the English Standard Version. So if yours is a little bit different, you, uh, it's okay. Uh, you'll understand why. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia saying that Achai has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I'm sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready, as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. 
So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. Now, uh, I want to just start with this idea of giving is done in action. Y'all, intentions are great. Intentions are really nice. But until you actually follow through on intentions, intentions are also useless. They're pointless. We can all day, every day, as we sit in the church, go, you know what? The Lord is calling me to give, and I want to be faithful in that, and you have the intention to do that. But if you never follow through with it, then the intention is pointless. You might do the same thing and go, you know, I should really change the oil in my car. I should really get to that. You have every intention to do it. And 10,000 miles later, you haven't done it. And your car just doesn't seem to react to you the way it should. And you're going, what's wrong with the car? It's because intentions don't change the oil. Actions do. And that's why giving is done in action, not in intention. And so understanding that, I want you to see just a couple of things real quick in these first few verses, uh, some words that he uses so that we can understand what this means. Now, uh, superfluous, that was a word um, I love doing. This. Anybody use that word this week? Anybody? Okay, uh, y'all don't see this, but we're not surprised. Uh, Brett raised his hand. Um, I'm tempted to ask for a testimony uh, on how he used that word, but I'm sure he used it properly uh, and in context, so I'm just going to leave it at that. But that just means, listen, Paul says it's really important to talk about this. He said, I find it very important to discuss this. And so we understand that giving is important. This is not just like a side issue along with, hey, I want to be plugged into the local church. Hey, I want to be sharing my faith. Um, And yet, if I get to giving, God will be happy whenever I do. No, no, this is very important. Now, He says that he recognizes their readiness to give. Okay, Uh, real quick, raise your hand. Have you ever played the game Mario Kart? Raise your hand. Mario Kart. Okay, oh, okay, most. Okay, let's do this. How many, who's never played that game? You've never played Mario Kart. Y'all are the minority. Can you believe that? I did not expect that. Okay, when you play Mario Kart, first of all, I was the king of Mario Kart on, wait for it, Luke's already smiling. Um, I was the king of Mario Kart on Nintendo 64, okay? Mario Kart today is different, and I talk so much trash to my boys that wait until, because I, listen, I never lost on 64, I never lost, and then I played them, not only did they always come in first and second, I always came in last, I could not get the hang of that game. One of the things that you do in that game, if y'all have played it, you know before the, the light turns green, what are you doing? You're making your wheel. You're getting ready. You're like revving up. And this is the readiness that my mind immediately went to when thinking about giving, that when we come on Sunday and we're given the opportunity to give, we are ready to give because we've already had those wheels started spinning. Like we're, Now, I don't, don't take that example too far where if you rev it too far, you end up spinning out, you end up behind. Don't take that too far, Okay. But the idea is there's a readiness there, that you're getting ready to do something. And when we're talking about giving, Paul is saying, I recognize your readiness to give to the saints. And so that's the first thing we see. The next thing that we see in this is when he says that it is planned. He said, I see that you have planned to give. This is the gift you planned on giving. So you have set this aside. You have set this aside. It's the idea that you, uh, when you get your paycheck, you may set certain amount aside for your rent or your mortgage. You set a certain amount aside for gas. You set a certain amount aside for bills, for groceries. Maybe you have kind of like that entertainment part of your budget where like, "Ah, that's where we go out to eat or, uh, you know, go to movies or something like that. But then you also should, as part of that, you should be setting aside a portion of, of your money to give to the church. There is not just a readiness, but it is planned. And he says this because, and I love the way he puts this, so that when he comes and gets the gift, it can be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. Now, uh, I just 
wanted to understand those words a little bit more. Uh, and so digging into that, that idea of a willing gift is one that is decided on ahead of time. Okay, uh, just to give you this idea. Um, if you've done this, I don't want you to look down on the gift that you've given to God through the church, okay? But I do want you to just kind of think about this. How many of us will spend our money all week, and when we come on Sunday, if we have some in the wallet or account, we'll give? Instead of planning to give willingly, we set it aside. So with that in mind, he said he wants it to be a willing gift, all right? But not as an exaction. And what that means, I want you to get this picture. What if we went to, and one thing that we set out when we planted grassroots, which by the way, y'all, this coming Friday is 11 years ago that we planted grassroots. 11 years ago, to God's glory. Yeah, to God's glory. Um, glad glad y'all are excited. Um, so it's like 11. It's like anybody ever, you remember turning 17? When you turn 16, that's a big deal. You drive. 18, legal adult. You can vote, okay? Uh, but 17, it's like, yeah, enjoy the year, all right? It's a stupid year. Um, so that's a turning 11. Yay. Okay, so we set out to do this years ago. When we planted grassroots, we never passed offering plates or buckets. They would sit on the tables. Uh, they would sit by the door. They would hang by the door. We never, because this exaction that he's talking about is uh, he did not want somebody to feel pressured because you're standing over them. Like, can you imagine me coming to you? I'm going to use Ryan and Gina because they're right there. Uh, can you imagine me coming to Ryan and Gina right here and, and like standing there with the bucket and they give and I'm like, <laughs> and you just stand there looking. That's not what Paul wants to do. He wants it to be a willing gift that you have planned for ahead of time. And so giving is done in action. Now, let's look at verses 6 and 7. Giving begins in the heart. Verse 6 and 7 says this, The point is this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 6 uh, is wildly misused. It is, listen, not by everybody, but by a portion of pastors, they will use that verse to con you out of money so they can get rich. Okay, it's not what this verse is saying. I want you to go back to last week. The, the phrase I use that I think applies to verse 6 beautifully is, uh, it's not equal giving, but equal sacrifice. The gift from each of us will not look the same, but it is equally sacrificial in nature. That's what that means. He who sows sparingly, if you are not giving sacrificially and willingly, then, then God is going to bless you sparingly. But if you give bountifully, if you give uh, you know, willingly and cheerfully, He is going to bless you in the same way. Now, here's where it can be misinterpreted. All right? I'm not going to sit up here and tell you, you want a bigger house? Give more money to the church. I am not going to tell you that. I will, I will not, st I'm going to stand before God in judgment on a lot of things covered in the blood of Jesus, forgiven, but standing before Him for a lot of things I've done. One of the things will not be conning the church so I can get rich. There's going to be a lot of people that stand before God on that. I'm not going to be one of them. All right? There's going to be things I have to go, Lord, I thought I was doing right on that. Please forgive me. And He'll go, you were already forgiven. And I will say, thank you, Father, and enjoy His presence forever. But there's going to be one thing I do not stand in front of Him. And that is misusing the money of the church for my own gain. Not happening. But this is what we see here is that not equal giving, but equal sacrifice. And what he is saying is it is not about us getting more things so we give more. It is God expanding our ability to give more. So when I sow, okay, think about a field. When I sow more seed, there's going to be more crop. Okay, and then what am I going to do with that? 
Am I going to harvest it all and put it in my barn to hang on to and not let anybody else touch? No, the bigger the crop, the more I can share with others. That's what he's saying about growing in our giving. It's not growing in our giving so that we can have more things. It's growing in our giving so that God blesses us with more that we can continue to bless others with. Our generosity continues to show out to the world, to the glory of God. So, he then says that you don't give reluctantly or under compulsion. At first sight, I don't know if anybody else is this way. This is the way I was. At first sight, that reluctantly or under compulsion, it felt like he was saying, I don't know if I should give, or compulsion, you just throw your car keys in the offering bucket and just go, I'll figure the rest out. Okay? But that's actually not what those words are saying. It feels like this opposite ends of the line here where it's like, you don't want to give, or you, I'm, let me just put it, I'm going to give it to you the Darren way this morning, okay, real quick. This is not scripture, this is just Darren. You give like an idiot, okay, like you're not doing that, all right? What does it mean then to give uh, reluctantly or under compulsion? Here's, here's what those lines are. Reluctantly is marked by regret, where yeah, you give, but you wish you had. Where, yeah, I'll be generous, but I'm not happy about this. Or, the under compulsion is actually out of obligation. God will be angry at me if I don't give. So, I'll I'll give. So, it's this idea of, yeah, you're giving, but it's out of regret. Or, yeah, you're giving, but it's only because you made me. God's making me do this. Now, I want to help us understand this. Um... He then goes on to say, God loves a cheerful giver. When we think about somebody who's just giving with regret or giving out of obligation, when he says God loves a cheerful giver, yes, you've given those gifts, but God does not receive them as an act of worship from you. That's not an act of worship. Because all you did was just mark a box to say, aren't I holy? So what are we looking at here when God says that He loves a cheerful giver? That word love is that word that is a a sacrificial love. That's what it means. That God loves, God sacrificially loves us. And so, we can sacrificially give to Him and trust Him. Because God sacrificially loves us, How does He sacrificially love us? By sending Jesus the ultimate offering, the greatest tithe that was ever given. We can then sacrificially give and trust the Lord. And that's what it means when He says God loves a cheerful giver. We are given to sacrificially by God and so we can pour back sacrificially to God and that's where the result comes in the result is giving God glory look at verses 8 through 15 and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times you may abound in every good work As it is written, He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for His inexpressible gift. I want to I begin to land the plane taking us down kind of a I was going to say a path, but it's plain things. So we'll say a runway, all right? Uh, landing strip, however you want to put it. Um, when you look in those first few verses of 8 through 15, what you see, um, 
It is God giving us His grace. It is His sufficiency. It is His supply that He is pouring out on us. It's His grace, His sufficiency, His supply that He is pouring out on us. And when we grow in this discipline of generosity and giving, what does He continue, what does Paul say continue, God continues to do? He grows us in righteousness. That is God's righteousness at work within us through His Spirit when we are generous and giving. And then He continues to grow us in generosity. Like, do you know how much easier it becomes to give when you're just practicing it? When you realize that God continues to supply? Like that He is... My dad used to say this all the time. Maybe you've heard a preacher saying this. Um, you're going to hear this preacher say, you cannot outgive God. Like, you're never going to come to the end of God's resources. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, but I think we could have testimonies. You're looking at your bank account going, I don't know how this is going to work this week. And you get to the end of the month and go, how did that work? I can remember being in college, and my brother and me, we shared an apartment. We had part-time jobs going to college. And there were times that it just, literally, he'll tell you, he goes, I still don't know how it worked. God provides. It's His sufficiency and grace and supply. He grows us in righteousness and generosity, and He grows us in love for the church. Look at the church in Corinth. They were begging Paul to be a part of giving to the needs of the saints in Jerusalem. They wanted to be used. They loved the church and they wanted to give. And when we give, it grows our love for the church. It grows our commitment to the church. It grows our desire to be involved with the church. And I'm gonna, this wasn't in my notes, but I'm going to put this one in there. And as we continue to give, and God is faithful, and the church, I'm going to put the leadership is faithful in this, it grows your trust in the leadership of the church. That they're going to do with the, what, the money what we say we're going to do with it and, and honoring God with it. There's a lot of people that withhold their offering because they don't trust the leadership of the church. I get that. That's between you and God. It's not between you and me. We've seen maybe in our church experiences some bad use of money. We're like, man, I don't know about it. Can I just offer this up to you? This, y'all, this is, none of this is in my notes. This is just... We got time. Ask me for our budget. I'll give it to you. Ask me for the numbers from the bank account. We have a company that sends us monthly reports. I'll give it to you. You can see exactly where the money is going. Do you, know, do you know why I can do that? Anybody want to guess? Because i got nothing to hide. Do you know how free that is? When you give, I'm not sitting there going, well, first of all, I'm not walking around with the bucket going to give more. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you if you give more, God's going to give you the bigger house, better job, better car, or the health. But I am going to tell you God will honor your gift if you're giving cheerfully, sacrificially, faithfully, but all he's doing is growing you in that discipline so that you can give more. That's what he's doing. And so I have no problem going, you can see the budget, you can see the bank account. I don't care. Because I got nothing to hide. And listen, just so we're clear, you can walk up to me afterwards and I'm not going to be like, well, I didn't mean it. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to go, yeah, give me your email address. It'll be in your email tomorrow. Tuesday, whenever I get in the office. So how does it result in God's glory? Paul says that when we pour out, when we are generous, when we are giving, it pours out in glory and thanksgiving to God for the people that receive it. People see our generosity. And and can I just say this, church? Listen, don't, don't go political on me. Let's just go reality for a second. The economy's tough. 
things are getting expensive. But it's not beyond God. God is not on His throne wringing His hands going, how are they going to be able to afford to give? Like God's not doing that. He's not worried in that way. And so we can faithfully give. And here's what I love. I love uh, the way he phrases this, starting verse 13. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God. Does he say they'll glorify God because they got money? No. They'll glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ. And then he ends it saying, thanks be to God for His inexpressible gift. Do you know why we can follow in faith giving to God and giving to the church? Because we confess Jesus Christ as our Savior, the inexpressible gift of God. The gift given by God Himself to us. The ultimate offering. The supreme offering. More than we could ever give or do. We follow His lead, that inexpressible gift. We confess Jesus as Lord, and through that we live out this transformed life. And we give. We don't give reluctantly or with regret. We don't give in compulsion or out of obligation, but we plan, we set it aside, we trust the Lord, we trust the church, and we give cheerfully and sacrificially. We ended last week with this thought, we need a changed perspective. And the best way I can put it, you're talking about giving money to the church. Literally, as Christians, it was never your money to begin with. It was never my money to begin with. We are giving back a portion of what He has given us. And so we trust Him with it. And we give cheerfully and we give faithfully. Because, church, let's just end on this note. Because Jesus is the greatest gift that could ever be given, that we could ever receive, It's the gospel of Christ that we follow and we trust. And so our perspective on money and possessions changes. And so we give. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for uh, your word as always. Thank you for the privilege to proclaim it. I pray that you will grow us in this. God, continue to give us wisdom on how to leverage uh, the gifts you have given us as individuals, as families, Um, giving to the church that you would give us wisdom as leadership. God, we want your kingdom to grow. Jesus, we want your name to be known and your gospel to be proclaimed. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.